welcome back to another Backyard Professor Chess video. I've been talking about past pawns. I'm going to talk about the opposite now, the backward pawn, and the problem with the backward pawn. Um, and I'm going to take Archer Yusupov, build up your chess mastery number three. He has, in chapter nine, he, on the backward pawn, he has three or four games, and then he has 12 or 13 <clears throat> Uh, chess puzzles for you to work on. I'm going to use just the one game, Vasily Smisliff and Arnold Danker. Smisliff is playing the white, Danker is in the black. The idea with a backward pawn is you have to fix the pawn. Let me show you just a quick illustration, real quick. If, let's say, black had the Let's say black had the, the Dutch. If white can get a pawn in there, that fixes that backward pawn. Why is this a backward pawn? Because the pawns aren't here. See the difference? Here, these pawns support that pawn. Here, these pawns actually support that pawn because every square all the way across in front of them is covered. But here, that pawn has no protection. He's vulnerable. He's a weakness. Especially if you can get a knight. This square here, the e5, would be called the hole. And that would be definitely a target square for white to get either a piece or a pawn in because it fixes the backward pawn and it would cramp black. That's the basic principle of a backward pawn. It can be a weakness if you fix it. That's one of the goals with a backward pawn. Fix that pawn. So the square in front of the backward pawn is the most important square. That square, black would want to keep free and he would want to control the influence of that square while, fight, while white would fight putting something in that square or at least controlling it with, say, a bishop. The bishop coming through it would control that square and it could help prevent that pawn from advancing. You can solve the problem of the backward pawn very easy if you can safely advance the pawn the weakness completely disappears that's interesting isn't it here you really have to work <clears throat> you better hurry up and figure something out so that's basically the gist of a backward pawn now to play against a backward pawn the game he uses is Vasily Smisliff and Arnold Danker this was in Moscow 1946 and I'm going to take this from the book, straight from the book. I have, I've had a very busy day, so I haven't had a chance to analyze the game a lot, but I played through it a couple times, and this is really an excellent example of a backward pawn. Yusupov did a great job finding a great game to show us the issue here. They're both going to be in Keto, their bishops, so we're going to have kind of a cross a sword crossing of the diagonals here and then he goes d3 giving support to a central pawn and then he goes e6 and then bishop e3 he's going to keep developing and now Danker uh, that's a little soon that's a little premature to put an outpost it would be better if you developed more now Arnold Danker understand this is a grand master I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just saying, for we amateurs, that looks like an amateur move. And yet it is a grandmaster play in this. So he's getting a little anxious. Uh, I don't know if there was any history between <clears throat> Smithsliff and him. I have no idea. But that is not the best move because it'll be chased away. And then he'll forever lose that fantastic central outpost. He's also moved the piece twice. Uh, if you don't need to, don't do that in the opening, right? So knight c to e2, and he's already challenging the knight. He immediately challenges the knight, in fact. And now d6, 
And now, the aim of putting this knight here is so that he can advance this pawn, and after he chases the knight away, advance this pawn. So he's going to have a strong central pawn thrust. The knight to e2 helps him achieve that, because it's covering those two squares. And those two squares are really influencing the center. So I just recently criticized Danker for moving twice, and yet Smyslov has too. So see, it, it's the nature of chess. But this can be chased away, and that, I suspect, he, he doesn't, Yusupov doesn't say that, that's just my thinking. That's really too early. Honest. So, and he came to d6 now. So, the way to do this is chase the knight away. Doggone it, that was a good central uh, post. But now he doesn't have it. Darn, that sucks. And now, notice again, Smyslov, by moving his knight twice, accomplished something seriously significant. He gave support to central pawns to advance and possess central squares. Danker's knight just simply took a faulty outpost because it was too early, and now he's just simply moved back. He has accomplished nothing. Smyslov knight has accomplished an enormous amount. That's the difference between them each moving that piece twice. So, so just, just note that difference. And now the black, C takes D4. He's going to take the D4 pawn. And here, the knight takes D4, a good outpost, at this point, because the principle here is he wants to attack the D6 pawn. And you say, wait a minute, that knight only attacks that pawn. Relax, he's not going to attack it with the knight. What Smyslov has done, because he's exchanged pawns the way he's exchanged, is he has opened up a semi-partial D file where this pawn is. The reason he's picking on the D6 pawn is because that will be the backward pawn because he's not going to advance it because this pawn fixes it. If he advances any pawn, he'll advance that one. And, in fact, that might be why Smyslov put his knight there, to entice him. Say, come on, pull that pawn up here, because now that makes that pawn a backward pawn. Here, there is no backward pawn. There is no weakness with the pawns standing side by side. Once you advance a pawn, now you can blockade that pawn, and therefore it's a weakness. Interesting how that works, huh? So, Knight just simply took the d4 at this point. And now the bishop takes d4, giving him a good bishop outpost. And now, see, e5. Because it's better to threaten the bishop than it is to push the pawn and threaten the pawn, right? It takes away the really strong diagonal for the queen bishop. Because he has the king bishop that will possibly get a strong diagonal, although right now the pawns are locked. So we don't know that yet. So... Bishop comes back to e3, and Smyslov has completely accomplished everything he wanted. Notice the subtle cat and mouse here. He is putting pieces up here on an outpost deliberately to provoke Danker to push the pawn to create a weak backward pawn. That's clever chess. That is so typical Smyslov. Now there's a partial d-file that can directly attack that pawn. So now 
it has become a weakness. Unless, unless he can find a way to advance it safely. But at this point, not happening. Nope. So this is interesting chess, isn't it? Bishop comes to, okay, let me make sure I did this right, e5, and then bishop to e3, drop the bishop back to e3, and now the knight comes to e7. And the idea here is to keep his development going. He has a huge variation. I, I can't take time to show it to you. Sorry. Knight e2, because I want to show you this principle of how to fight against a back pawn. This is a great game to show this. Castles, but it's a fairly long game, so I can't take a whole lot of time, but I can take long enough to show you a spectacular game with a spectacular theme. Bishop to e6, he brings up his white bit. Now he's, again, now that the pawn is here, he is influencing that square, so that's a correct square for the bishop. Because black knows that that square is going to be nasty for him, which makes that backward pawn weak. Look, it's hanging. Literally, there's nothing protecting it. That is a target, and Smithsluff does everything he can to aim for that target. Isn't that interesting? The whole game is going to revolve around that. You find one weakness and go after it. Very interesting how the grandmasters do this. So queen comes to d2. And queen comes to c7. Rook f to c1 directly across from the queen because he wants to fix that pawn weakness. Absolutely fix it. And how he's going to do that, he pops the f5, hitting the pawn that's supporting that square. So that pawn move makes sense. Right? And now c4. Now we have two pawns that can potentially, and he's backed up the pawn uh, that is not connected here with the rook because the queen's on this end, right? But now this square is protected twice, even though this one's attacked once. There's no way that pawn's going to go there because that will give Smithsluff a pawn chain in black territory if he chooses to take either here or here, either way. So this is a very interesting strategy Smithsliff is going with. And now F will take E4, so the one pawn that helped keep that pawn uh, from moving forward is now gone. Of course, he's got the doubled central pawns, but now the other one supports that. So from here on out, Danker has a serious weakness in his entire structure. Well, two of them if you think the double pawns are weak, right? So this is getting to be a tough go for Danker. Now the knight will come back over to c3. Look where he's heading, man. Man, that's an outpost, yes? And it will affix that pawn. If that knight gets to here, it'll stop that pawn from ever moving. And, and there's nothing that can chase the knight away either. So, whoa, man. This is getting very tough, very fast for black. Knight f5, he's going to try to break something loose. And now, now interestingly, the knight takes e4. Takes the front pawn of the doubled pawns at this point. White has the two important central squares, d5, and e4 under control, right? So he is really dominating the center that Danker can't because of the weak backward pawn. Very interesting. 
Knight takes e3, takes the bishop. And now queen will take the knight. And now h6. And rook to d1. There's the target. Now he's got a direct strike against the weakness in the center of that backward pawn. He's accomplished his goal here to that point. And Danker properly says, I have to support the pawn. He's not fighting his open file right now. He's fighting to support that weakness. Yeah. And Rook A to C1 continue giving support to the pawn that keeps that pawn at bay because the queen is still here. So both rooks on partial files for a different reason than opening up the file, although that is a goal. Right now, it's just to make sure that pawn stays weak because look how it just divides his army and everything can focus on that. It's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting situation. And then Black also puts his rook, rook A to C8, so that both rooks are opposing each other. However, the pawns are in a completely different situation. This is a power pawn preventing the advancement of the weak pawn. If he can get that there, the weakness completely disappears. But he can't. And it is under pressure, and it is under pressure. So it is supported, and it is supported, but notice how everyone's coagulating around that weakness. Cool to see that. B3, why not? Take your time. Make sure your position is as solid as you know how to make it. That's not bad chess. B6. And now knight C3 three again, because now that you have the rook here backing you up, why not possess the outpost? Oh yeah, that is really nice. White wants to exchange the light squared bishops. So, oh, and he is aiming for a position with a good centralized knight on e4 against the bad bishop on g7. The bad bishop is bad because the central pawns are on the same color as the bishop. That is why he is focusing on, let's get rid of the other bishop. It's worth exchanging down to have a powerful central knight against a weak bishop. You see the point there? That's a really good point. So black comes to queen e7, and now bishop d5. Yeah, whoops, I could have just left it. Bishop d5. And king comes to h7 here, and bishop takes e6. Get rid of the, the good bishop. Absolutely, that is great strategy. Now the queen is supporting the pawn, as is the rook, and... Rook to d3. You can see what Smithsliff is going to do, huh? The entire purpose of the whole setup of white is to continually attack the weakness in Black's camp. That backward pawn. So he's going to double his rooks. That's the best way to attack it, without question. So that is exactly what he's doing. Rook c7... We'll see if black can respond. Rook c to d1. Blam! There you go. That's the setup you want. And now rook comes over here to f7, grabbing the partial open file, hitting white's backward pawn against his king. He's attempting to do some counterplay. Here is what he is doing. And now knight e4. Powerful centralized pieces powerful centralized pawns for white. Now he's directly hitting 
the weakness one, two, three times. And he has a pawn here that can potentially hit it four times. So, yeah, I know, there's, there's two of them there, so that's probably not what he would do. I'm just saying that as a, as a statement to let you see that. Knight e4, and now bishop comes back to f8, and now again, you see, now the moves are making sense. Yes, the bishop gives support, the queen gives... You notice the queen has never really ever moved away from here. From this weakness. I mean, she's not zippity doo don over here trying to attack the king or nothing. She can't afford to. She must make sure that weakness does not fall. The rook, the queen, and now the bishop is in on this. Yeah, very interesting. So, bishop f8, rook to d5, a direct fixing. Just in case. He gets any ideas to try to push the pawn out of desperation, even though it might wreck his central position, he'll get rid of that weakness. So Smisloff puts the nail in the coffin of that idea. Now that's a permanent weakness in Black's camp. That's how to fight against a backward pawn. This is a fantastic illustration of that. Really nice. Where was I? Rook d5. Queen g4. Queen has to try to get some counterplay going. Try to break up something here. Do something to try to get some counterplay. White is way too powerful right now against his weakness. Rook 1 to d3. Now what does that tell you? Why would he keep moving his rooks up the line? Because is he going to put his queen, well, not there, but is he going to put his queen in here too? That would really give that file some dominant power. That would enable him to break through and take the weakness, which will completely shatter black. That's crazy how that works, but that's how it works. If, if white succeeds, he destroys black. So, let, so let's keep watching. Queen g4, rook 1, d3, bishop to e7. So he's trying to make sure all of his forces are together as much as possible. Gives him another option here of possibly breaking up the king side. That's, that's, uh, that's, you know, that option's there. He's got the rook that can come to here. He's got the queen directly. And so uh, perhaps Danker is trying to get at least in a position to start doing some counterplay because he knows his weakness is falling. He lost the battle with the weakness. It's going to fall. That's obvious. Truly. So he's trying the best he can. Bishop Isa. And here we go. Knight finally takes the pawn. The pawn does fall. Yeah, he, he is as maximized against that pawn as white can build, so now it's time to pull the trigger and, and uh, attack him. And the bishop will take, and the rook will take, and interesting, the rook comes to here. So Danker is really trying to put some extra pressure on the king side of white because white has broke through the center. He has conquered the weakness, just, just so you know. So, so this is a, um, it looks like it's a pretty good attempt of Danker to at least try to sway the central forces of white over into a defensive mode instead of an offensive mode. And then the rest of the game he presents without commentary, but I'm going to show it to you. I probably won't have a lot of commentary either, but I'm going to at least show it to you. Bam! Not only did the weak pawn fall, but then the other pawn fell. The center absolutely belongs to Smisloff. No question. And that wins games. Now we're approaching, we're definitely in the middle game, we're approaching the end of the game, and that powerful center.
That is a main theme in Grandmaster games. Without question. And here comes the attempt at counterplay. But he's too little too late. Notice how the defensive power of black not disappears, but is, is uh, weakened even more simply because of the weakness that fell. Smithsliff attacked that weakness relentlessly, he conquered it, and now Black can't even hardly defend. It's so interesting how that connects, truly. Rook 8 to 7. Rook takes the Rook, check. So Rook comes back up. See, his counterattack is refuted because Smithsliff broke through into that backward pawn. That's significant. He shows us how to fight the backward pawn. And now look, 8th rank. Of course, you'll see why shortly. You, you probably already do see why. Rook to g7, but not much else he can do. And now queen to e8, and... You know, you dominate the 8th rank. I, I've shown games where rooks are dominating the 7th rank, and that's about enough. But when you dominate the 8th rank, holy cow. Wow, here it comes, man. G5, he's got to give him an escape square because, of course, you know that's where the queen's going. There's no question there. And then king to G6, and then rook Again, on that file that he conquered the weakness, now he can come back down and cross-attack the king. I, th this, is, this is fantastic uh, chess. So he's going to remain near his rook because his rook can be a good shield. His queen isn't way off over here in La La Land somewhere. She is in the general vicinity as well. So Smithsliff has to play crisp. It's not just a free-for-all. However, queen does take h6 now. Now things fall apart. Now things fall apart. Because, I, I know, it's crazy how this works. He attacked and won the central weakness, that backward pawn, and now his whole position collapses. Isn't that remarkable how that does that? It happens all the time. That's why we have to know about backward pawns and how to fix the problem. Yeah. Uh, queen comes to f5. Rook immediately comes to d1. Queen to c5. Check. King to g2. Queen to e7. You have to stay around your king. Because there's not enough force here to attack the king and win. So he is forced back. Uh, this is too strong. God got it. This is too strong. You gotta guard your king. Just want to point that out. Rook f1. So he was able to utilize this beautifully in these directions. And now he can come back down and utilize this one. This is great chess, you guys. I'm telling you. King G8. You notice how you notice how his rook is his shield, right? Queen F6. Ooh, Smithsliff's getting tough now. He's saying, "Let's uh, let's let's swap the queens." And Danker can't. No way. Uh-uh. Can't do it. So queen comes back here to f5, g goes to 4, rook to 2, queen to e7, queen to d3, rook to g5, rook to e2, threatening the queen. Queen to f8, staying around the king. Queen to e4, making sure that pawn doesn't get anywhere. 
He's also keeping track of this diagonal. Notice how he's moving. He wants to keep that king as close in that corner as he can. Yeah? Rook to g7 again. Queen to d5 check. Queen to f7. Rook to e6. And that's where black resigned. That was all. That was enough, he said. He is outgunned with pawns. In an end game with rooks and queens, if you have pawns and your name was Vasily Smisliff, you could win. <laughs> so that's a great game for backward pawns. That's what I wanted to show you so bad. Now, there is another game that I'll show you in the next video, also on this same theme of backward pawns, only this time from world champion Mikhail Botvinnik. And it is staggeringly good. It is exceptional. Oh, I guess I should say happy chestercising. That's going to be a completely different video. I don't have space to put two of them in this one video, so thanks for watching my video, and I'll see you in the next one. These two are related.